Am I enjoying it? Yeah, I think I I 100% am. I I often think about it when I'm at work or when I'm doing things around the house. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hopefully y'all are having a great day. I forgot to say this at the beginning of the video, but remember to subscribe and like and comment down below because that really is awesome and it helps me out. And share this with your friends. I was I, I said later on in the video that I'm going to put this into the beginning, so here you are. You'll see that at the end. Bye. You might notice uh, today's video is in a bit of a different scene, and that's because I'm going to be making a different kind of video today. Uh, I wanted to give a total guide uh, for beginners uh, in getting into espresso. And I'm not giving this to you guys from the vantage point of an, uh, an expert, uh, but rather uh, a beginner who has gone through about a month and a half's worth of work in espresso and has learned quite a bit. So I feel like I'm at the point where I know enough to give some good information, but I still remember what it was like uh, day one. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this video. Uh, in today's video, I'm going to cover a few things. One, why I got into espresso making, uh, how this whole journey began, um, what I thought the journey would be and what it actually ended up being, um, some of the materials that I have purchased uh, in order to kind of do this hobby proficiently, um, and then some closing thoughts on where I would like to see this go and, you know, kind of my journey so far. So let's get into it. So I, much like most people, uh, have uh, an, an espresso machine, right? And the Nespresso machine is good, right? Uh, but I found that after a while, it didn't really matter what pod I was putting in. It just felt like the same bland, very acidic coffee that I needed to add either creamer or milk or something to it uh, in order to make it palatable for myself. So I kind of thought to myself, okay, well, maybe I want to try a different kind of coffee, right? Maybe maybe I need a new machine. Maybe it's something, right? So I began my research and my dad has worked in the uh, food and beverage industry for over 30 years now. Uh, primarily, he services coffee machines. So I figured, who better to ask than the guy whose job it's been for the past 30 years uh, to do coffee? Maybe I ask him, what kind of coffee machine should I get, right? So I go on Amazon, I'm looking, and uh, every machine I send to him, he's like, you know, ah, you know, you that's okay. I mean, you can do it for cheaper, or you can do it for this, and... Eventually, I was like, "Well, I don't, I don't know what machine to get, right? Because it seems like everything I look at, it's either ridiculously expensive, or I'm not sure if it's going to fit my need, right?" Um, and then eventually, I stumbled on this person's uh, channel, whose name is James Hoffman, and James Hoffman did a review of a few different um, coffee machines, but notably espresso machines. And I thought, you know, I have an espresso machine. Maybe I get a new one. So I start watching his reviews, and lo and behold, I come across this wonderful device called the Flare Pro 2. And I was intrigued. It, it seemed like an awesome deal. And really, the thing that sold me was the fact that either he or somebody had commented that uh, proficient use of the Flare Pro 2 uh, can rival that of many industry machines uh, costing over $1,000, uh, whereas the Flare Pro 2 itself was only about $325. So I thought to myself, this sounds like a fantastic deal to me, uh, a manual machine that I can put my wits to the test and see if I can get the skill set necessary to make good espresso. So with doing a little bit more research, I ended up making my first purchase, which was uh, the Flare Pro 2, which uh, if you watch my last video, thank you very much for all of those uh, viewers. That was much more views than I've ever received. So uh, at least on this channel. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I stumbled upon this, the Flare Pro 2, and what a journey it has been, right? I won't say good, bad, anything until we talk about that later, but that is how the journey began. Now, what I will say to those people who are kind of on this journey or figuring out if this is something that they want to do, what I would say is if you do not care about the art of making espresso or you do not care about the science of making espresso and you just want to enjoy a good espresso, I would say don't bother with a machine. Don't bother with a home unit. 
I would even just say go to your local coffee shop and just order an espresso, right? You're going to get a fantastic product most of the time and it's going to be great. Um, Making espresso is a lot harder than I thought it'd be. Um, There's a lot more work involved to have a decent cup. Um, You can have terrible cups and it's no problem, right? Uh, It's as easy as the Nespresso machine, right? Um, But if you really want a premium cup of espresso, um, this is not a short, quick solution to that need, right? I would definitely say if you just care about having a good espresso, go to a coffee shop, drink it there, support local businesses, and just enjoy, right? If, however, your thought to begin making espressos is one of intrigue, uh, one of curiosity and one of, I guess, more dedication to the journey versus the destination, then I do think you're in the, you're in the right space uh, to start making espressos, right? And then from there, you could decide what it is that you want to do, uh, whether that's to buy a machine that will do it for you or to take the route that I took and buy a manual machine, right? Totally up to you. Uh, There are hundreds of videos on YouTube that I recommend you go check out, uh, including that of James Hoffman, um, as well as uh, Senor Lance, uh, who has been my uh, recent uh, binge watching. So I'll link both of them down below. Uh, But really appreciate you two for inspiring my journey thus far, and uh, I really appreciate your content. So with that being said, um, that little bit of a warning out there for those who are looking at this video and thinking, okay, uh, what does it take to get into the hobby? Um, that's the one precursor I would say. If you're not ready for the journey, this may not necessarily be for you. Not to say that it isn't, but I just thought I should let you know that because that's something I didn't expect. And had I known that early on, would it have changed my opinion? Maybe. Uh, do I look back and regret it? Absolutely not. I have loved every part of it and have been enjoying myself ever since. So with that, uh, let's get into the materials that I purchased uh, in order to get started in this hobby. And what I'll do is I'll keep a running total right here or here, whichever side I end uh, putting the edits on. Uh, So that way you can see, okay, how much uh, did it take for me to get into the hobby and, you know, to pretty much get started, right? Because the cost of entry is high, but, you know, pretty much recurring costs, uh, especially with a manual setup like I have, uh, is pretty much just buying your coffee beans. So uh, let's get into it. So first things first, uh, we have the uh, Flare Pro 2. And the Flare Pro 2 is a fantastic manual tool. It comes with all these different things. Um, So really, when you buy the Flare Pro 2, you get a like an entire suite of things that pretty much covers a lot of your base needs. Um, And you could really honestly get the Flare Pro 2 and be done with it um, if you want to just do like average starting out coffee, right? I used all the materials that came in the Flare Pro 2 when I first started and I did okay, right? It wasn't the best. It wasn't the worst. Um, Well, I I guess relative to now, it was the worst, but uh, you know. It was fun. It was a good learning experience. I made a lot of mistakes uh, using the baseline equipment and I learned from them and it forced me to become a uh, better espresso maker as a result of it, right? So this was the first purchase, right? Um, A purchase that I did prior to starting espresso, but that I just had lying around, which I would highly recommend you get is a, well, um, that's kind of like in there, but it's a uh, temperature setting uh, kettle, right? Uh, if you're from Ireland, I heard these are just stock in all households uh, for tea time. But um, for us in the U.S., I, maybe that's not a common thing. Um, you can just boil water, but boiling water brings the water to 212 Fahrenheit, which is... A little on the hot side, you're going to see a lot of um, a lot of over extraction at those temperatures. Um, ideally, uh, if you're going off of like scholarly articles on espresso, you want to aim for the call it 92 Celsius to 95 Celsius around there, which is about 197 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're you're over by you know a good portion, right? So 
I recommend getting that. Water temperature is one of the variables. It's not the uh, most influential variable, but it is a variable that you'll want to control down the road. And it's got multiple uses for a bunch of different things. So I recommend you just get one. That one you don't need to spend a whole lot of money on. Really, any baseline um, kettle will do. So I also chose gooseneck because um, I like I like it. My girlfriend said she had a gooseneck kettle and she really liked it. So I was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, okay, cool. So we got Flare Pro 2. We got the gooseneck kettle with the temperature setting. Um, next up that we bought, and I'm going to put stuff away as I bring them out so I don't get a, a big mess here, um, is going to be a fellow uh, coffee bean storage canister, right? I'm going to put stuff away while I talk. So when working with uh, an espresso maker and subsequently uh, coffee beans, you want to make sure that you are um, you're storing your beans in a very uh, airtight way. And when researching different canisters for coffee, right? Because I, I much like a lot of other people, had this uh, this coffee gator, right? Which is good. Um, there's a difference between these two uh, coffee storage devices. This one pretty much just seals in whatever air is in there, right? You just pop the lid off and then you have just an empty canister, right? This has no way to displace the air that's inside of the canister, you just simply lock in what's in there and seal it shut, right? You have, um, there's a CO2 valve uh, or filter here, uh, but that's pretty much it. Um, the fellow um, the fellow coffee canister, however, this one through use of a twisting motion to go back and forth on the top actually has a method to displace the air that's inside of the canister and push it out, right? And the way it tells you it's a vacuum seal is you'll see a little green light pop up uh, when you've created a vacuum inside of here. And to release, you just press this button. I'm not gonna do it because I wanna keep my beans fresh, but you'd press this button and hold, uh, and then you just open up the canister. And then when you're done, like I said, you pop it back on, you twist it back and forth on top, and then you create that seal. Now, um, I highly recommend this one. It was relatively cheap for what it does, in my opinion. Um, I even ended up getting two, uh, one to store one type of bean, one to store another, just in case if I want to like switch it up. Um, but we'll get to that in a bit. I don't recommend you switching up right away, uh, but at some point you will want to. So, um, coffee bean canister. Now, uh, why do I say coffee bean canister, not coffee ground canister? When making coffee or espresso, you really want to have fresh coffee. Pre-ground coffee, I don't think is the best. Um, it goes stale relatively quickly. Um, and overall, you're just going to have a lackluster experience if you get pre-ground coffee. Also, most of the pre-ground coffee uh, that you're going to buy at a grocery store or something like that is um, ground way too coarse uh, for espresso. So if you try and pack a puck um, with store ground coffee, it's just going to shoot right through and you're going to be super under extracted and it's not going to be a pleasant experience, right? So uh, you want to buy whole beans. Now, obviously, you can't brew espresso with whole beans. So what do you do? You buy a coffee grinder, right? And similar to my pursuit of uh, espresso machines um, on whether I get a machine or I get a manual device, I too had a similar conversation with myself about coffee grinders, right? So I decided, um, do I want to go manual or do I want to go machine? And eventually I ended up deciding going manual, right? Now this one, uh, much like the espresso machine, was very purposeful, right? So for the espresso machine, the reason why I got manual um, initially was the cost, but then it eventually became the amount of control that I had over certain variables in that, whereas machines are graded for a certain amount of um, flow coming out. Uh, you can really vary a lot of that with a manual machine, right? You can put more pressure, ease up the pressure. It's really up to you. Um, early on, that translates to variability and inconsistency. But once you get practice going, you can maintain consistent flow. And now you actually have more control over how much flow you want to put in throughout the espresso process, right? And this comes in with pressure profiling, right? Um, but in a similar vein, for grinders, um, I wanted to get a manual grinder because um, Lance actually put out a video that discussed grinders in depth and why certain grinders work um, and how they work, right? 
Um, or actually, I'm sorry. That was uh, that video was James Hoffman, I believe. So he discussed that there's a few different grinders, right? There's the classic blade grinder that you see a lot of places have. With this, you don't really have a whole lot of control over ground size. Um, it's really violent when the beans smash, right? It's just like a blade spinning as fast as it possibly can, just smashing into the beans, and then it breaks off into several different pieces with no control over how big those pieces are. So you're going to get a lot of grind inconsistency with that kind of machine, right? Which gets us onto the topic of burrs, right? Uh, you have two different types of burrs uh, within grinders. You have a flat burr and a conical burr, right? Majority of machines use conical burrs. Um, and that was what I personally searched for in my machine. But the selling point for manual grinders for me was uh, really price as it pertains to the motor and price as it pertains to the motor function, right? So in order to make things, um, well, one, to get a good consistent grind, you have to have a very powerful motor, right? Because it has, it, it, I forget the science behind it, but there's a method to going slower versus quicker. And what a lot of companies will do is they will put in a cheaper motor um, and just make up for it with RPM. Right. So that's why a lot of the more expensive grinders that are going at a much slower rate will almost be silent. Right. Whereas if you hear some of the cheaper grinders, it's like a right. Like it's very loud. So I thought to myself, OK. I'm a decent I'm a, I'm a decently strong man. Right. Like I, I I can I can maybe grind some coffee beans. So I thought I'm going to be the best motor on the market and grind my own coffee. So then I thought, OK, let's go with the manual grinder. Right. Now, I made the mistake early on with uh, by not checking what grinders truly were good for espresso, right? There were some grinders that market themselves to be able to do espresso grounds, but do not believe the titling on selling products on Amazon or whatever, right? Do, I, I Actually, you know what? I'm just going to save you the research time. Buy this grinder. Plain and simple. If you take this journey seriously and if this is something that you genuinely want to do, uh, for a long period of time, invest in this grinder. Um, it's the J Max. Um, again, I'll, I'll link it uh, down below. But this is this is the one. Just trust me. Get it. Um, it's fantastic, right? Why is it fantastic? Well, when I first started out, I got the Bomber Espresso Grinder uh, on Amazon, right? And it was about a hundred bucks, right? One hundred nine. Um, what I didn't know at the time is I just took it at face value. Espresso hand grinder. That's exactly what I'm looking for, right? Couldn't be farther from the truth. So when getting grinders, there's two types of grinders. There is stepless grinders and stepped grinders, right? A majority of grinders on the market are stepped grinders, meaning there's a little tick, 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 tick when you move the when you move the setting, right? And what's happening is it's moving the burrs wider or more narrow, right? Which obviously affects the coarseness of the grind. Now, why why did one grinder fail me and this one didn't? Well, it comes down to what each of those steps actually is, right? So classically, there's been two ways to measure this, uh, with one being the much more widely used and objective measure, right? So one is called burr gap. Burr gap estimates the gap between the two different burrs in a grinder, right? So um, basically, grinders work with two sets of burrs. They they kind of go like this, like, and burr gap was estimating the gap between these two burrs, right? That one is unreliable, right? It depends on your grinder being exactly factory, trued up, perfect, right? Over time, you're going to bump it to get some of the coffee grounds out. You're going to be doing some maintenance, and eventually it's going to go out of line, right? Now, your burr gap estimations are off, right? No longer no longer valid, right? And they're estimates at the end of the day, right? The second measure, which is much more accurate and is more widely used now, is what is called burr movement. Instead of calculating an estimate of the gap between the two burrs, you are now calculating how much the burr is moving per step, right? Now, both grinders I got were stepped grinders. Both both grinders that I got um, were, were good, right? They were good conical burr grinders uh, that had steps. The difference was on the other grinder that I had, 
one setting was too coarse and another setting was too fine. And what does that tell you? It tells you that the burr movement between the steps is way too big, way too big, right? And I spent probably a whole bag of beans trying to figure this out because I, I couldn't figure it out. I grind one, it's too fine. I grind the other, it's too coarse. What do I do? Well, I'm early on. Maybe I maybe I try and think of some solutions. Uh, girlfriend bought up, well, why don't you do half one size, half the other size, right? Perfect idea. Sounds like that should work, right? No, no, no. That creates channels. And you don't want channels. That results in over extraction. So you can't do that, right? So we just tried everything under the sun to try and make this work. And I eventually watched a video. It was a 30-minute video of some random guy in some coffee shop who tested the grinder and came to the exact same conclusion I did, that one was too fine and one was too coarse. And you know what that told me? That told me I need to get a new grinder. So... I did research and I found Lance, obviously, one of my two mentors, and he did a video reviewing the Easy Espresso uh, grinder series and talked about the J Max. And the J Max was the premium espresso grinder, right? Whereas on the other one, uh, I would guess that probably the burr movement was maybe 50 microns, something ridiculous, right? Um, but this one, each step is 8.8 .8 microns. That is tiny. That is minuscule. The amount of settings that you have on here that actually are in your espresso range is crazy, right? Um, you're obviously going to find a good range for you know the different roasts that you buy. But for this one, with the roast that I'm working with, I mean, there's there's a decent range. Like I have four or five, six different settings at least, right? Do I use them all? No. But it helps when exploring different beans and trying different grind sizes, right? Um, so all in all, that was a very long spiel, but this is your grinder. Get this one. Trust me, okay? There you go. So we've covered the uh, the machine. We've covered the kettle. We've covered the uh, canister to store your beans. We've covered the grinder. Next up, uh, what you'll want to get is a uh, method to measure your beans when extracting, uh, well, I guess pouring out your beans and then measuring the extraction amount, uh, you'll want to get yourself a scale. Now, this scale uh, was relatively cheap on Amazon. Um, it's a greater goods product. It has served me well. This will probably be the next thing I upgrade. Uh, this is probably going out uh, within the next, call it maybe a couple weeks, um, especially now that it's uh, Prime Day, so feel free to click any of those links down below. Uh, those are uh, helpful to the channel, so I appreciate that. Um, but this is probably the next thing to go. Why? Well, I've progressed to the point in my journey where I am now curious about flow rate, right? And without getting into flow rate, um, basically, I need to buy a super fancy scale that's probably going to cost me about 120 bucks um, that tells me how fast the liquid is entering my cup. Um, and you know, that will be able to help me change my brew and my extraction um, and a couple other variables. But for the time being, for the past month or so, I have been using um, this greater good whatever scale and it works perfectly. Uh, when you're looking for a scale, really what you want to do is you want to find a scale that can uh, measure down to 0 0.01 grams. You can get one that goes down to 0.1 grams, but I find that it's a little bit um, finicky. Uh, I, I, I much recommend you go with the um, 0 0.01 gram measurement scale. So again, I'll link this down below. Um, I really recommend it. I liked it. it. Worked great for me. Should work great for you, right? Okay. So what else are you going to want to buy? Um, next thing you want to buy. Actually, I'll go in order. I didn't buy this thing next. Uh, the next thing I bought was a, uh, a little filter here for my basket. Now, when you buy the Flare Pro 2, it's going to come with this thing, right? It's a puck screen. What you do is you, right on top of the grounds, if you watch my other video, you'll see that I actually used this puck screen. Um, and the idea is that it helps disperse water when you're pushing uh, water through into the puck, right? Helps distribute the channel evenly. Um, this is okay. Not great. Reason it's not great, in my opinion, and this is not backed by anything. This is just my opinion. These little holes uh, are 
basically a bunch of small channels, right? Uh, that pretty much you can only go in those, right? What I bought is this Pavant 45.5 uh, millimeter puck screen. Now, I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to try and get as close as I can. There's no holes in that. That's just a mesh. And it's sandwiched. And then on the other side, there's another mesh. So when you're talking about like even dispersion of water, I think this does a much better job than this. It could just be how I brewed the first cup and the second cup. But I noticed that when using this puck screen versus this puck screen, I liked the taste of this one more. Now that could totally be confirmation bias, but it is, I think, seven or eight dollars um, and well worth it in my opinion. So invest in one of these, right? While this is important, I do not think it was as important as this next purchase, right? Um, this is a tamper. And this is the tamper that comes with your uh, Flare Pro 2. Now, this is okay. It did the job. I tamped with this for three weeks, right? It was fine. However, what I started to notice was that when I would tamp down, I would notice that it's kind of sitting at a little bit of an angle. And I didn't really think much of it at first. And then I started to watch more videos on uh, puck prep. And then I realized how important it is to have a nice and level puck. Because otherwise, if the puck is slanted and water is getting pushed through with significant amount of pressure, water is going to find the fastest way out of that pressure. Now, if your puck is slanted like this, water is going to flow this way and flow through here, which is going to result in over extraction here and under extraction over here, right? Doesn't matter how good your puck prep is. If your puck is uneven, then it, it's it's a mess, right? So I, I, I work so hard to just yeah, yeah, even, yeah, okay, yeah, and then realize I messed it up, right? I was over it. I was done. Didn't want to deal with it anymore. So I looked into um, replacement tampers. And I came across the uh, Normcore tamper. And boy, oh boy, uh, this was a headache to get. Um, not by any fault of the seller, but just by fault of Amazon delivery. Uh, the package failed like three times. Um, and I got it on the third. But anyways, I'm just venting. This tamper is fantastic. Now, why? This is a spring-loaded tamper. Um, and if you can see, it's got two steps, right? It's got this little outer rim here that, let me see if I can do this, that moves, right? And then at the bottom, you have this actual tamper. Now, why is this so good? Well, one, uh, it's spring loaded. So it's the spring in here is rated for 30 pounds of pressure, uh, which is a good tamp. But this is why it's so important. The basket for the Flare Pro 2 has a rim. On this rim, this little lip rests, right? Meaning this is level. It cannot be not level, right? When I push this down, what that puck is going to be just as level as this. Fantastic. What happens? Uh, oh, I put it away. What happens when I tamp with this? You see that? Nani the what? I can go in, di I could, I can puck, I can tamp diagonally, damn it. Can I do that with this? No. Look how great that is. Bam. Even puck. Ugh, not even. What is this? So anyways, this is okay to learn. This is not okay to use long term. Get rid of that thing when you can. But it doesn't even have to be norm core, but just get something uh, if you get the Flare Pro 2, it's a 45.5 millimeter basket. You're going to want to get the Normcore 45.5 uh, millimeter tamper, right? That'll fit nice and snug in there. It's actually made for the Flare Pro 2. And then you knock that down and get yourself a nice, clean tamperunski. Okay. Uh, almost done. Sit tight. Hang in there. Um, the next tool I want to talk about is the WDT tool or the Weiss distribution technique tool, right? 
what does this do? Well, when you grind coffee, and especially when you're grinding as fine as you are for espresso, um, the grounds are super fine and they can often clump uh, post grind, right? These clumps, when tamped down, uh, can kind of like team up in certain areas, right? And the result is you get a an uneven flow, right? You get something that could inspire a water channel. Now, I say this a lot, but basically, um, long story of it, or long story short of it is, a water channel is an efficient path for water to get through the puck quickly, right? We don't want that, right? Because what What's going to happen is that water is going to all go down that one channel and the beans in that area are going to be super over extracted and the beans in other areas are going to be not extracted at all, right? We don't want this. We want to make as uniform as a puck as possible so that the most efficient path exists everywhere in the puck. Because when the most efficient path exists everywhere on the puck, water will flow through the entire puck naturally, right? A good way to tell this, if your uh, basket um, by the way, the Flare Pro 2 comes with this little uh, this little attachment that you can put at the bottom of your basket. I recommend not using this. Um, it's cool. It keeps some of the mess off if you're uh, brewing a gusher uh, where the flow just goes out way too quick and it just splashes everywhere. But looking at the bottom of this when you're brewing can tell a lot about what's happening uh, to your espresso. So I recommend keeping that open for educational purposes. Right. So. Back to this. Um, when people try to brew, again, like I said, they, they just want a nice, clean, even puck, no clumps, no nothing, right? So that's where this tool comes in handy. On this tool, uh, you'll see a bunch of little fine needles there. And what this does is you go into the puck, you do these small little rotations, right? I, I go in a circle and then I do mini circles as I'm going up, right? And I slowly lift up my WDT tool until I'm out of the puck or I'm out of the grounds. And then I am distributed, right? So these needles are fine enough to where they can go in, they can break up any little clumps that have formed in the coffee before you tamp, right? Um, there are some WDT tools that are like fixed, right? They have varying needle lengths and you just kind of put it in and you spin it. That one's okay. Um, you don't really get a lot of the depth variation that you do with just getting a manual tool. And I think these are cheaper anyways. Um, I'll, like I said, I'll put a link to the one that I bought, but um, it was relatively cheap. But um, no matter who you talk to, it seems like a lot more people nowadays are uh, adopting the WDT method uh, for um, declumping your grounds. So I recommend getting this. Um, it's super cheap and it's a very quick and easy fix um, for clumping. Um, this one's optional. Um, use it or don't use it. Uh, it's a little misting bottle. And inside of here, I just have filtered water, right? Um, I spray this on the beans before I grind them. Uh, when you grind beans, a little bit of static electricity builds up. And especially when you're working with really fine coffee grounds, that static electricity can actually lead to this concept of retention. Uh, when you get retention in a coffee grinder, you're not going to get all of the beans out that you put in, right? So let's say if you're trying to measure for a 16 gram, uh, 16 grams of coffee grounds, if you have high retention, you may only get like 15.8 grams out, which I know it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you're working with such small amounts of liquid um, and extraction, it matters, right? Um, because when you when you brew espresso, you brew in ratios. Again, we could talk about that in another video. This video is really just to talk about the, the, the gear. But um, spraying the coffee beans down does help a little bit with retention. That in combination with just brushing out uh, the bottom of the coffee grinder that I have into the basket, um, I find maybe I get only 0 0.05 grams of retention, um, which is good, right? Uh, if I if I don't try and clean it all out, I may get like 0.1 grams of retention, which is actually, I've, uh, I mean, I think pretty low, uh, but correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, spray bottle, completely optional. Um, I spray my beans, you don't have to. Um, just, yeah, cool. Um, this one is home homemade. Homemade. Um, the coffee mirror was the one thing I couldn't justify buying online, um, buying a, an espresso mirror that magnetizes to my Flare Pro 2 and cost me 40 bucks. Um, I would much rather go to the uh, 
Target down the street, buy this little compact mirror, break it in half, and it has a little light, right? Uh, there you go. Look at that. A little espresso light. So what I did was um, I took this mirror. I went on Amazon and I bought these little like stick-on magnets. And I cut one in half, put it out there, put another one down there, and just pressed it on. This is an L bracket that I bought at Home Depot for 75 cents and used all of my might to bend it. Um, find it, find your nearest adult if you are not able to bend it. Uh, well, I guess stronger adult. Um, I don't think being an adult is based on if you could bend an L bracket, but boom, there you go. That thing is angled. Remember how earlier I told you you should watch the bottom of your basket uh, and it'll tell you a lot about your uh, brewing technique? Now you, can, now you can do it while you're brewing. See? Come over here. I can... Oh, let's not unplug my mic here. I could be brewing. And then I see the bottom of my basket and I'm, I, I, can, I can do a lot now. See? So, mirror. Very cheap. I don't think I can link that um, because I basically stole uh, a compact mirror from my mom's house. Um, and yeah, so make your own. I think it's easy to do. Um, am I forgetting anything? I don't believe so. Oh, I did buy this thing. I bought this little uh, puffer thing. Uh, this is good for getting and cleaning your grinder. Um, I bought this originally because the grinder that I bought Initially, that was way, 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 way not good for espresso. Uh, didn't have one of these. If you do get the J Max, uh, then it comes with this little thing. Uh, so you don't have to go and buy it, right? Comes with its own. Isn't that fantastic? So you don't have to buy that. Cool. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, and then coffee beans. Yes, coffee beans indeed. Um, the coffee beans that I use, um, I buy directly from the coffee shop itself. Now, a uh, quick little caveat while we're going. I just wanted to make sure I didn't mute my mic early on and uh, this is all just quiet. I would have sucked. Um, when buying coffee, try your best to buy it from a coffee shop. The reason being, when coffee distributors sell to uh, supermarkets, supermarkets don't really want to advertise coffee how it should be advertised um, because of how average consumers uh, look at dates, right? So for coffee grounds, uh, well, especially uh, coffee beans, I should say, um, the roast date's important, right? Because right after you roast, uh, the beans go through this natural process where they're giving off carbon dioxide, um, and you want that to actually happen a little bit, right? So for espresso beans, um, right around a week after roasting is like an ideal time to start brewing. Um, however... In a supermarket setting, if you were shopping for beans and you saw that they were roasted on blank date, uh, that was a week ago, you'd be like, ooh, those seem old. I don't want them, right? So how do coffee or how do grocery stores get around this? They put a best buy date, right? Now, this best buy date is terrible, right? This is saying pretty much you can drink it up until this point. Does that mean it's good? No, right? But it allows them to carry more inventory and sell it uh, to a reason or to someone who's just like thinking reasonably, right? Like if they see like, oh man, the expiration date uh, or the expiration date, the best buy date uh, is three weeks away. I'll definitely have the whole coffee bag in three weeks, right? Sorry if I said three days, I meant three weeks, right? Three weeks away, I could definitely drink all that coffee in three weeks, right? Should you though? Maybe not, right? So. When you buy directly from a coffee shop, a lot of times they will actually have a roasted on date, which is much more useful than a uh, best buy date. Um, if you're in California um, and some other areas, I don't know where else they sell it, but Pete's Coffee, uh, which is a local brand to California, is actually really awesome. What they do is on the grocery store bags that they have, uh, they put a roasted on date as well as a best buy date. I don't know if that's something they negotiated in selling to um uh, grocery stores, but I appreciate that. So you can actually buy Pete's grounds at a coffee store or uh, I'm sorry, at a grocery store and you get both pieces of information, which is fantastic. I think everyone should do that. Um, definitely a viable solution. Um, I think that's about it. As far as like materials are concerned, uh, I'm trying to check my fridge here. Uh, 
No, nothing in there. Oh, I guess maybe um, completely separate to it, but um, we have a water filter. Uh, this one's a zero water filter, but really anything that you get is going to be able to, you know, kind of do the job. Um, I did some research on water filters, and that one actually gets uh, zero parts per million, uh, which is the measurement for how uh, pure water is. So um, that one's good. Uh, Brita filters work fine. Uh, I just don't recommend using your tap. Uh, you can start to get some uh, scaling, especially if you are using a machine. Uh, if you're using the um, just the Flare Pro 2, uh, and you can clean it out after every use, like thoroughly do it, you know, but uh, try and use filtered water. So, um, cool. That's all my equipment. Um, I have a timer too, but I mean, I guess you could use your phone. So, you know, I'm not going to put the price of a phone on here, but you know, hopefully you have one as well. Uh, if not, you can just count in your head. That works too. Um, yeah. So some closing thoughts uh, in my journey so far. I have absolutely loved it. It's been fantastic. Um, thankfully, I've been able to do this uh, with my significant other. Uh, she really enjoys uh, coffee, which is good, right? She can try all the product that I put out there. And um, it lets me test twice as fast per uh, per use because I'm not drinking four cups. I'm only drinking two and she's having the other two. So that helps out a lot. I recommend if you have some friends, um, bring them over so that you can brew a cup, taste it, and give it to them, right? Uh, instead of just like tasting and dumping, uh, which, you know, some people do, but it is a little wasteful. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Would I do it again? Yeah, I think I would. Uh, am I enjoying it? Yeah, I think I, I 100% am. I, I often think about it when I'm at work or when I'm doing things around the house. Uh, I think about different brewing w methods I can use. I think about videos that I could watch. Um all in all, it's a fantastic experience, and I really think that uh, if my intro didn't scare you off and you've made it to this point in the video, I definitely think you should give it a try, and uh, let me know what you think. Let me know your journey, and um, if you enjoy this content, um, I'll continue to make more of it. So yeah, stay tuned, subscribe, comment, do all those things. I should have said that at the beginning of the video. Um, so actually, I'm gonna do that right now with some fancy editing. Uh, but anyways, hope you all have a wonderful day. Um, take care. Bye.